Hello everybody, once upon a time there was a company called Porsche, or if you prefer, Porsche, and they made sports cars. Not everybody liked them, but everybody knew if you bought a Porsche, what you were going to get. They made sports cars with the engine in the back, sports cars with the engine in the middle, and eventually sports cars with the engine at the front as well. And generally speaking, they were very good things too. However, there was one teeny tiny problem. Despite the fact that these were popular products, they were built to such a high standard, the one thing Porsche didn't really make was a profit. The road to profitability for Porsche began in the 1990s, and the first step was the introduction of an all-new entry-level model, the Boxster. Though not universally loved, it was still a sports car, and today is regarded as a proper Porsche. However, the big change came in 2003, with the arrival of the KN. This was not a sports car, it wasn't even a sporty saloon. This was an SUV, an affront to all that was natural in the eyes of Porsche purists. We must take a moment to remind ourselves that this was 20 years ago, so the idea of any sports or even luxury car company, aside from Range Rover, producing an SUV was a very radical one. A Lamborghini, discounting the rather mad and very limited run LM002, did not have an SUV. Ferrari certainly did not have an SUV. Bentley did not have an SUV. Lotus definitely did not have an SUV. In fact, even Audi did not have an SUV at that time. But now, Porsche did, and it sold like hotcakes laced with Class A drugs. It quickly became their biggest selling model, and gave them the taste for profit. The taste! Love it or loathe it, the Cayenne at least had the decency of being a high-end car, with a range of almost exclusively thirsty petrol V8 engines and luxurious specifications. It was designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the top-end specification Range Rovers, so it could be argued that unlike the Boxster, the Cayenne improved the brand's premium credentials. This, though, could be a tougher sell, because though it may have a Porsche badge on the front, it is both smaller and cheaper than the KN, and under here you will find a four-cylinder engine from a Golf. Now, credit where credit is due, Porsche actually waited just over a decade before giving the KN a little brother, and in the interim they launched the fairly wacky Coupe Saloon Estate Hybrid that was the Panamera, a car as unconventional as the KN was conventional. However, by the 2010s, it was very obvious that the rise of the SUV was now unstoppable. And so, in 2014, we saw the arrival of this, the Macan. But even when launched, the Macan was far from alone in its market segment, and today it is practically drowning in a sea of near indistinguishable SUVs, all with interchangeable specifications. And that's just the offerings from VW. What then really is a Macan, and is it a proper Porsche at all? That's what I'm going to be asking today, and hopefully, answering. To give you a lay of the land, this car's competitors in terms of both size and price would include the likes of the Alfa Romeo Stelvio, the Jaguar F-Pace, and from within VW, the Audi Q5, which confusingly also makes it a rival for the BMW X3 that's actually quite a bit bigger. The nature of so-called progress means that, humorously, the first-generation Cayenne is actually closer in size to this than its modern-day successor, and so the Macan for me is just about perfectly sized for the roads of Britain. It is certainly a big car for us in America, I think this is classed as a compact, but here, with windy roads and bad drivers, this is about as big as I think you want a car that you can day-to-day -day take just about anywhere without having to worry. Though the Macan has been in production now for close to 10 years, there is still no official word on its replacement. We all know that Porsche are working on an electric SUV, however, there is a rumour that's not intended to replace the Macan, but in fact sit alongside it, giving people the choice of whichever powertrain they feel suits their needs the best. The Macan lineup currently consists of four models. The base Macan has a 265 PS four cylinder turbocharged engine, as you would essentially find in a Golf GTI, but with Porsche specific tuning. Unlike the Golf, it is turned around so sits longitudinally and is connected to an all wheel drive system and a PDK gearbox. Above that, you have the 380 PS 3 litre V6 Macan S, and above that, the 440 PS Macan GTS, which takes the place of the old Macan Turbo. 
The T for Touring sits between the Base McCann and the S, and in Porsche parlance, a T should be a model that prioritises driver engagement, so it appeals more to the petrol head crowd, because rather than focusing on outright numbers, it instead wants to create a sportier drive in a two-ton SUV. That is a bold move particularly as this car features exactly the same engine as the base model with the exact same power and torque outputs. And it's £5,000 more, making it 55,800 quid. To justify that price, Porsche say the car features extensive standard equipment. Let me take you through some of that now. So, what have we got? Sunroof? No. Air ride? No. Sports exhaust? No. Bose? No. Soft closed doors? No. Double glazing? No. Auto dimming mirrors? No. 360 degree parking camera? No. Heads up display? No. Adaptive cruise? No. Keyless entry? No. Uh, memory seats? No. So that's Porsche's idea of fully loaded. What does the T actually give you? First up, you get these 20 inch alloys, one inch bigger than on the base model, but one inch smaller than on others. And I think they're just about the right size for a car like this because they still have a pleasing amount of sidewall on them. You also get PASM, Porsche's adaptive dampers, which come here in a setup specific to the T that sits 15 millimeters lower. You can have air ride if you want, but it does remain an option. By default, the car sits on regular coils and springs, and that's what this one has. You also get standard fit adaptive LED headlights that actually work fairly well. And to my eyes, this is a pretty good looking car. It's no Da Vinci, it's no Stelvio, but as these things go, it has a bit of presence about it. And it does at least do the job of looking like a Porsche. You aren't likely to mistake this for any VW product, certainly not any recent one. It has this absolutely enormous grille at the front, which has become very trendy of late, but I think pulls that off fairly well. It also does a pretty decent job of maintaining a little bit of familiarity with its bigger brother, the KM, and to my eyes, is a pretty pleasing thing, if not award-winning. There are some styling changes for the T, but they are subtle at best and involve chiefly a slightly different and more aggressive lip at the front, which you'd be entirely forgiven for missing, and some of the details being painted in a colour they call agate grey. The transformation is so subtle, in fact, that just to make sure you know which model it is you're looking at, Porsche have handily written it on the side for you. Now, of late, I've done quite a bit of moaning about the interiors of many a Porsche products, chiefly because no matter how wild and wacky the exterior is, inside, people still seem to go for the dullest options they possibly can. In fact, the other day I saw a picture of a car with a Sonderwunsch, that's a Porsche's Special Wishes Division 911, with a $100,000 flip gold amazing explosion paint, and uh, inside, black. Just plain black. I mean, Who's the person that spec that car? Hello, Porsche, I want a special car. Cool, what do you want? Uh, I want a, a really amazing colour called Gold Explosion that costs the same as a whole car. The paint on that costs more than this whole car. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. What about the interior, sir? Oh, black. Um, gold contrast? Oh, no, 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 no. Let's, let's not go wild. Black, please. I just got out of a Cayman GT4 RS. Yellow outside. Inside? Black. Turbo GT, KN. Drove that as well. £150,000 car. Nuttermobile. Outside, grey. Inside, black. But I'm going to be giving the McCann a little bit of a break for two major reasons. First off, though yes it does feel like just about every other Porsche in here, chiefly because of the colour choice, it does feel like just about every other Porsche. Not Audi, not VW. So even though it may have a relation in the Q5, to sit in it, you'd never know. In fact, the dash steering wheel here are almost exactly the same as the Cayman GT4 RS that I just got out of, ignoring the fact this has leather rather than Alcantara. Secondly, certain material choices like the uh, not leather here on the door, I cannot forgive in a £150,000 car, but in a £50,000 car, I can, because the overall impression is still of a very premium upmarket place. Bespoke to the T, you have these GTS seats with extra sculpting, and in the middle, you've got this Racetex fabric, which looks a little bit odd. I've grown rather fond of it. feels much nicer than you'd imagine. It's quite abrasive to run your hand over, but decent to sit in. And there's other good stuff, like the fact you've got a gear lever here that moves. Either side of that, you'll find the very nice looking but slightly awkward to use haptic buttons, though the temperature controls are physical here. 
up top, you've got a touchscreen display with all your Porsche communication management, and on the steering wheel, you've got just about the right amount of controls. One thing to note about this car, you can do the gear change manually, but not with the lever. To get into manual mode, there's a small button on the wheel here, and then you use the paddles behind, which also, in the Cayman GT4 RS or a 911 GT3, are a little bit small and piddly and not quite up to the task. But in a 56 Grand Macan, I think they're just about good enough. They're certainly better than the ones you get in a Golf GTI or even, shamefully, an R8. Space in here is just about okay. If you're a family of six footers, you may find this car not quite good enough. I've got slightly short legs and a longer torso, so I can sit myself behind myself just about okay. But if I were any longer of leg, it would be tricky. The boot though is still of a decent size and of course the seats can be folded too to give you extra luggage space if you need it. Mercifully, this car has also not been specified with the optional privacy glass, so that does help lift the interior a little bit, though I really would spec the panoramic roof. Yes, I know that goes against the ethos of the T and will certainly add a bit of weight and cost, but it will also really lift this interior. And if you are specifying a Macan, another thing I will say for Porsche, there are some amazing options. I spent a bit of time in the configurator last night and you can create some truly special stuff. Genuinely an amazing selection of colors, materials and all sorts. You can have a wooden steering wheel, a wooden steering wheel in a Macan. And if it weren't for the fact that um, I don't think they're doing any deals on these cars, I'd really be thinking about buying a new Macan as a daily driver because I do quite like it. Now, truth be told, there is just one real issue I have with this interior, but it's one big enough that it could be a genuine deal breaker, and actually might be for me in terms of buying one of these. That's this. Not the fact that it is a touchscreen, it's a very nice touchscreen, very high resolution, very clear, but the fact that this car, brand new, in 2023, does not have Android Auto. Most of the rest of the Porsche lineup now has it, about five years too late. The Cayenne I had last week has it, but this does not. You've got basic wired Apple CarPlay, and that's it. And for me, that's just a compromise I'm not sure I want to live with for a brand new car. I can get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in a first gen Cayenne. I can get it in a 996 now, but this, no. Hopefully, Porsche will fix that soon, and I'd like it to be that you can then upgrade the older model to have the newer functionality. But I'm not sure that's going to be the case, and it's not something I'd really want to take a risk on. Shame that. On top of that, Porsche have made what I feel to be a catastrophic error of judgment, one that is so severe, I think here in Britain, the Macan T has almost no hope whatsoever of finding any customers. But before I damn it, I need to drive it and find out if in isolation it's still a good car. Yes, it is. In fact, I'm really going to stick my neck out on this one, and I'm going to say this is not just a good car, it's a great car. Those last two press cars that I've had from Porsche, the KN Turbo GT and the Cayman GT4 RS, they're both the products of Porsche's fabled GT department. They're the ones that petrol heady types go all gooey over. However, I can assure you that having now spent quite a bit of time in modern day GT products, they're no longer fit for daily usage. They simply aren't. 15 years ago, a 997 GT3, though of course in some ways compromised, that's the nature of the beast, it was also a car you could really use day to day. But now, that no longer feels like it's the case. And yes, I have just given the Turbo GT a rave review because it deserved one in order to make a two and a quarter ton SUV so agile, interactive and enjoyable as Porsche did really is a fabulous achievement and deserves celebrating. But equally, it was also a car that felt at all times just a bit too big for the kind of roads where I like to enjoy a faster car. And though it wasn't quite as firm as I'd feared, it was also a car that was just a little bit stiffer than you'd like all the time. I have actually found this with many recent Porsche products, not just ones from the GT department. I think we need specific suspension settings for the UK market. In my experience, what the Germans consider a normal or comfort setting is really what I'd consider sport, and we should have one a little bit below that. Ferrari can do it, so I'm sure Porsche can too. And in fact, in many of the lineup, the Base 911, the Taycan, and this, they have set the suspension up just about right. 
the Cayman GT4 RS then, if it were loved any more than it currently is, it'd start walking on water. But though it certainly is amazing when you start to push on, by the time it's become exciting, you're doing speeds that are so high, not only are you going to prison, but on the way, you're going to fall down a lot of stairs. And uh, that to me does take away from quite a bit of the enjoyment. It also, when you weren't having fun, was a car that was so loud all the time after just a couple of days, I was very, very happy to hand the keys back and get into this. And I know there are a great many people out there that would consider that a serious downgrade, but not I, because the uncomfortable truth for many a petrol head is the fact that as a daily driver, this is infinitely superior to both the Cayman, which is fairly obvious, and less so, the KN2. Sure, it isn't anywhere near as quick as either of those. It's sprightly, and here in the T you get the Sport Chrono Pack as standard, so the 0 to 60 time has dropped to 6.2 seconds, which still isn't quick, but on roads like this, it feels adequate. You have a selection of driving modes down here and in the middle the sport response button which I really quite like. If you're not familiar with that it's a thing you get with sport chrono Porsches. Push the little button and for 20 seconds it gives you full attack with everything. Chassis, gearbox, engine, the lot. It's an overtake button in essence. The major modes available here are Normal, Sport, Sport Plus and Individual. There isn't an awful lot that you can choose from, you've essentially got a setting for the powertrain and one for the chassis. If you have the air ride on these cars you can also adjust the height of it, but here you cannot. And to be honest, having driven this now, I'm not really sure I'd want the air ride because comfort mode for the chassis is set up just about perfectly for the kind of roads that I enjoy. So much so that on occasion, I have even tried Sport and Sport Plus mode and wound up not hating them entirely, which is my default stance when it comes to many a Porsche product. You press the Sport button in a Cayman GT4 RS and if anything was loose in the car, you'll know about it pretty quickly. But in terms of that all-important question we're asking today, what makes a Porsche, I'd say the suspension is bang on the brief because it gives you that comfy, luxury aspect that you expect from any brand that's asking you to pay a little bit more, but also that added sense of dynamism, that little feeling of being slightly better tied down that you want from a sporty car like a Porsche. I love the dash, it gives you all the information that you need. The screen on the right has various different settings exactly like in the Cayman, so you can see all sorts of stuff, most of which you don't need to know about. But it feels genuinely different, it feels like a portion. I really, really do quite like it. Proof, if ever it were required, that in many cases an all-digital dash is simply unnecessary. And I actually think a proper classy analogue set of dials can feel a little bit more upmarket than just having another big screen. Another thing that Porsche tend to get quite right, and here is no exception, the seats. These are the ones from a GTS, but in the T they are standard fit and I absolutely love them. They are extremely comfortable even over longer journeys, but also quite supportive. So when you do begin to have a little bit of fun, they hug you just about enough without feeling like they pinch you too much. No complaints there, although I cannot say the same for the visibility. Forward, it's generally pretty decent. The wing mirrors are quite good too, but the B pillars are very chunky and quite far forward. So at certain junctions, it can be a little bit tricky. And over there, between the seat and pillar, you do have a considerable blind spot as well. Rearwards is pretty decent, and this car also has the optional 360 degree parking cameras, so for manoeuvring, it's actually not a problem. At around 4.7 metres long and just over 1.9 metres wide, it is on the large size for your average British car parking space, but it's not anywhere near as much a squeeze as in the KN. There are also some other details that I noticed in this car, and I have to say, did take me by surprise. Like, for example, the fact that, yes, this car does have lane departure warning and the like, but you can turn it off, and when you do so, it stays off. I'm pretty certain that modern cars are required by law to make sure that stuff turns on every time you start the car, but perhaps because this is, technically speaking, an older model, Porsche have been allowed to get away with it. In any case, it's one small little thing that I do really appreciate. 
around town, the engine and gearbox are perfectly competent. The 7-speed PDK does a very good impression of being a regular automatic, and there's a reason it is so revered. Likewise, the engine, though it doesn't sound particularly exciting, it responds reasonably well, and at no point has it frustrated or left me in the lurch at a junction. But I hear you cry. Well, yes, of course, that's all well and good. SUV is nice and comfortable and decent around town. But what of its sporting credentials? After all, Porsche tell you this is supposed to be the most driver-focused of all the Macans. Well, as it happens, we're just about to hit one of my favourite B-roads. So I'm going to stick the car in individual, which has the comfort chassis, but the more dynamic powertrain settings. Move over to manual mode for the gearbox, and let's see how she does. Naturally, it's important to go into these things with realistic expectations, but if you do, bearing in mind this is a two-ton SUV, what you'll find is a car that really is remarkably enjoyable and considerably more engaging than you might have expected. Okay, the engine is quite flat, and if you're in anything other than Sport Plus mode, it also doesn't seem to want to go to the alleged 7,000 RPM red line. And rather frustratingly, even if you're in Sport mode for the powertrain, if you put your foot all the way down, it will still kick down, and if you hit the red line, it will still shift up for you, which um, in a Porsche, I don't like so much. However, Sport Plus does remove those restrictions, and as you can decouple that from the chassis mode, it's not an issue. In fact, I am currently now in full Sport Plus mode, so powertrain and chassis, and it's, um, it's brilliant. The steering is quite decent, it's nicely weighted, doesn't have masses of texture and feedback, it doesn't wriggle in your hands, it's electrically assisted, as you might expect. However, it does talk to you just enough, you get a feeling of what's going on with the car. I have to say, when doing this sort of stuff, I do really appreciate the little screen that shows you the distribution of torque from front to back wheels. In case you're wondering, by the way, the car has some 400 newton meters of it, 295 pound foot. Not exactly a lot for a two-ton bus, so though it's, um, brisk, I would say fast is not an adjective I feel comfortable using. Unless we're talking about the gearbox, in which case it's entirely appropriate because this really is a very responsive unit and this is another area where expectations do alter how you see something. You see, the gearbox in the Cayman GT4 RS was very much like this. In fact, I think it may have been a touch smoother. Incredibly quick. The up and down shifts are incredible. I mean, let me give you a, a couple of down shifts. So we're in fifth and let's go for one that's fourth. It's instantaneous, and the way the engine revs up is also genuinely impressive. But it doesn't have drama, it doesn't have theatre, and in a Cayman GT4 RS, I want that. But in a McCann, I don't expect it. So the fact I don't have it is just less of an issue. I'm more impressed by just how fast it is. And it means that though the engine doesn't have masses of power or torque, because you've got slightly shorter ratios than were this a six speed, it does still feel not quite the disappointment that you may be fearing. At some point, of course, you will eventually try and throw this around a bend and physics will tap you on the shoulder and go, <clears throat> no, 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 no. But, as you can probably tell, conditions out there today aren't perfect. It's been raining most of this morning, and if I were in the KN, I'd probably be getting a little bit concerned, because that car, in order to achieve what it has, was fitted with a set of Pirelli P0 courses. This, though, has Michelin Latitude 3s on, which are a much more suitable tyre for this kind of car. They've never at any point in time felt inadequate for what I've asked of it. I love the fact this gearbox has a proper lever, it makes the business of doing this sort of stuff just that much easier. In fact, let me just try and chuck this car around a bend with a bit more gusto than I probably should and see what the chassis does. Really good. Really, really good. Planted, solid. I don't even think the traction or stability intervened there. This car is finding grip that I didn't really think it could. This section here has gotten really bad recently. The car rides over it fabulously and that's in Sport Plus mode. So, James, 10 out of 10 for the McCann T, then? Ha, well, 
No, there are some issues. I would personally specify this car with the acoustically laminated glass, which I think is just their word for double glazing. Road noise in here isn't terrible, but I think it could be better so equipped. This car also has an option that I think everybody should specify, but if you weren't aware of it, could catch you out. That's the fuel tank, something Porsche have often offered with their models, but not always to UK customers. This car has a slightly larger one, 75 litres, which explains why when I got in it, the car said it had such a generous range available, just over 450 miles. This was very refreshing because when I got in the Cayman, that said it had just about 220. So I got near double out of this. You see, I was initially unaware this car had a tank quite so big, but I became suspicious as soon as I saw the fuel economy figures, and they're not so good. This morning, while I've been having fun, I've achieved 19.3. That's not so great. Over a longer distance, so the last 350 miles, this car has achieved 24.9, which is also not great. In fact, were this the GTS version with 440 horsepower, that would still not be a great figure. But it's not. It's the four-cylinder, two-litre, golf-engined one. And that leads me on to the one big fundamental flaw that the Macan T has. In isolation, I really like this car far more than I thought that I would. And if anybody's seen any of my other Porsche reviews, you'll know I really don't mince my words with these things. However, this car, as tested, is just under £60,000. The price before options is £55,800. And the issue is that the Macan S, with the 3.0-litre V6, and over 110 brake horsepower more, is about £1,000 extra. Now, in truth, the price difference actually is going to be a bit more than that, because once you do move up to the S, a lot of the things that are standard here once again become optional. But, and this is the big but, I think the vast majority of people on the hunt for a Porsche would happily spend an extra three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand pounds to get the much pokier, much more exciting car. And yes, sure, it's going to be a little bit heavier and that weight is going to be over the front axle, therefore compromising the dynamics. But this is where you have to be realistic, isn't it? This is a two-ton SUV. It was never, ever going to go round a bend like a 911. And so, in that case, I think you're just going to wind up going, yeah, sod the T, I'll have the S, please, with a lot more power that's likely of more interest to people more of the time, rather than the slightly nicer driving dynamics of the T. I really do think it might have helped that if for this version Porsche had at least said, you know what, okay, we're going to give you a 300 horsepower version of the engine because then you'd have a range which has got 265, 300, 380 and 440 horsepower variants and, and that feels like a nice natural progression. Unlike 265, 265, 380, 440. That's our big gap in the middle. And that's a shame because I think for a lot of people this really would be all the car they need. But a Porsche has never ever been about what you need. A Porsche is about what you want. The last time I drove a Macan, it was the Turbo from quite a few years ago, so not even the most recent iteration. This was the one with the slightly larger 3.6 litre V6. And that, I recall, being an absolute riot. So it's not as if you go for the bigger engine and the car becomes uninteresting to drive. Quite the opposite. And I have to say, one of the things I love about this car is the level of customization that they offer. Other manufacturers might try and put some distance between this and the KN by saying, no, 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 this is how you have to have it. Boring outside, boring inside. No, not the Macan. And for that reason, combined with the way that the car drives, the way it looks and feels genuinely different to anything else in the VW stable, I believe this can proudly and rightly wear that Porsche badge up front. But this does not get us around the rather thorny and inescapable issue that although the Macan T is an excellent car, and I would love to recommend it to you, I just can't help but feel that it doesn't offer value for money. No matter how much Porsche might try and tell you that it does. It's still £60,000 
for a 265 horsepower engine from a Golf. I suppose maybe that's the most Porsche thing about it. They've always been fond of not giving you that much power for your money. And in that regard, were the S, say, another 15 grand, this would be a lot more appealing. There are many places where the larger engine or the higher CO2 output will penalise you quite severely. And so for those customers and those markets, this is probably the perfect car. But it's not for this one. So there we have it. That's a little bit on the Porsche Macan T, a car for which I wasn't really sure what to expect, but turns out to have been a very pleasant surprise. Have you bought one? How have you got on with it? Why did you buy it? Please let me know in the comment section down below. And in any case, make sure you hit the like or dislike button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.